Ending a long wait, the center has notified a legal framework to assess and remediate chemically contaminated sites. Hello and welcome to Drishti IAS. My name is Saloni Nankyolir. In this video, we will understand what chemical contamination is and what does this legal framework entail. So, the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, it officially notified the Environment Protection Management of Contaminated Site Rules 2025. These rules fall under the Environment Protection Act of 1986. And why are these rules so important? Because they are first of its kind. They are the first structured legal framework to identify, assess and remediate sites chemically contaminated by hazardous substances. So, till now we were focusing only on the identification of sites, only on the assessment of sites, but there was no plan for the remediation of such sites. There was no proper legal framework. This is the first time that a structured legal framework has come into picture. That is why this becomes important. Now, if we start with the basics of what chemical pollution is and what are these chemically contaminated sites. So, chemical pollution is the pollution that is caused by the release of hazardous chemicals. And these chemicals could either be naturally occurring or man-made. But when they exceed a certain threshold, they cause chemical pollution. And these contaminated sites, they have been historically exposed to such contaminants. For example, landfills or dumping grounds. In fact, there is a very infamous landfill in Delhi. That's the Ghazipur landfill, which is contaminated by heavy metals. It's contaminated by hazardous chemicals. So, all these things, they cause groundwater pollution, they cause air pollution, soil pollution, everything of that sort happens. That is why these rules become very important. In fact, if you recall, there have been historical tragedies because of chemical pollution. For example, the Bhopal gas tragedy of 1984, where the leakage of methyl isocyanate that caused a lot of lives to be lost. So, these things have been happening historically. That is why there was a need for these rules to come into picture. So, why were these rules necessary? As I already mentioned that we did not have a proper legal framework. We were focusing only on identification. Identification of these sites. In fact, we had identified 103 such sites. But the remediation happened, like the remediation began only for 7 out of the 103 such sites. So, there was a huge gap. We focused on identification. We focused on assessment. At what is the level of contamination these sites have. But what was missing was the remediation. Because what is the job? Is the job just to assess and identify? No. The job is to end the contamination. It has to curb the contamination. That is why remediation was the most important step, which was till now missing from the picture. So, this becomes, these rules become very important. Now, if we discuss what is the significance of the rule or what does this rule entail, the implementation. So, it's actually a four-step process. First one is the identification. Identification and reporting that has been given to the district authorities. So, you'll notice that all levels of government have come into picture here. We'll talk about these. District authorities are also there. State authorities are also there. And the center is also there. So, district authority is going to conduct half-yearly reports. They are going to identify such suspected sites. And they are going to report it to the State Pollution Control Board. So, first step is identification which will, which will be done by the district authorities and they are going to report it to the State Pollution Control Board. Next will be the assessment process. So, once these suspected sites have been received, the list has been received, the Central Pollution Control Board or any other relevant authority, special authority is going to carry out the assessment process. They are going to carry out the assessment process within the first 90 days of receiving the list, whether these sites are actually contaminated or not. And if they find that yes, these sites are actually contaminated, a detailed report will have to be submitted in the next 90 days. And how is the State Pollution Control Board going to decide if these sites are contaminated or not? It is going to rely on the hazardous wastes rule of 2016. 189 hazardous substances have been listed there and if they exceed the threshold, if those hazardous substances exceed the certain threshold, then the State Pollution Control Board or the relevant authority is going to notify them as contaminated sites. And then the public disclosure is also going to happen. 
this is a very important step public is also going to be notified the general public is also going to be notified that these sites are heavily contaminated and in order to restrict uh, access to these sites this public disclosure is going to happen now these steps the identification and assessment was already happening because we had the 2010 capacity building rules in fact even in the environmental protection act of 1986 and the capacity building rules of 2010 we were focusing on identification, we were focusing on assessment, but there was no legal framework up until 2025. Now, the next step that has come in is the remediation and fixing of accountability. Who is responsible for this pollution? Who is going to pay for the remediation? All these things will be carried out in this step. So, the State Pollution Control Board is going to identify the polluter and then the polluter pays principle is going to imply. Polluter pays principle is going to imply and in case the polluter is not being able to identify it or the polluter has gone bankrupt, what is going to happen in that case? The center and state, they are both going to pitch in, they are going to give in joint funds and they will work towards the remediation of the contaminated site. So firstly, they'll have to identify the polluter. In case if the polluter is not identified, center and state both are going to come together and they are going to remediate the site. And then the last final step that has to happen is an oversight who is going to oversee all these things for transparency for accountability that is the central pollution control board an online repository will be maintained for all these contaminated sites and the central pollution control board is going to oversee the entire functioning for better transparency and a criminal proceeding can also be initiated if somebody has lost their lives because of chemical pollution so the Bharti and I Sahita rules will imply and if somebody has lost their lives because of the pollution, criminal proceedings will also be initiated against that polluter. But there are some exceptions. So those exceptions are radioactive wastes, mining related activities, marine oil pollution and municipal solid waste dumps. These things are not covered under the legal framework of this environment protection management of contaminated sites rules because these are already governed by the separate laws. We already have a list of separate laws to deal with radioactive waste, mining related waste, marine pollution and municipal solid waste dumps. So these are not covered in our new rules. That was all for today's video. If we talk about the way forward here, there are certain challenges. First challenge is that the timeline has not been defined. We are talking about remediation of these sites, but uh, until when? I mean, what is the timeline that will be given for the remediation? That has not been defined. So, first challenge is timeline. Then we saw that all the authorities, district level, state level, center level, they were involved in the identification, assessment and remediation. So, what is needed for timely implementation? Collaboration. Collaboration between all these levels. Strong enforcement is needed. These rules can only function effectively if they are strongly enforced, if there's a timely implementation of delays are avoided and they're strong and strongly enforced, only then we'll be able to reap the maximum benefits. And from where will the funding come? So adequate funding also needs to be there. In case when the center and state they have to pitch in when the polluter was not being identified, how is that funding going to come in? So adequate funding models also need to be there for timely implementation of the entire remediation. That was all for today's video. These rules are definitely a step in the correct direction. We are moving correctly, but we need to ensure that these are timely implemented and they are implemented in a proper manner. Now, let us practice a question for prelims. Consider the following statements regarding the environment protection management of contaminated sites rules 2025. One, they empower district administrations to identify suspected contamination followed by assessment within a strict timeline. Two, Sites contaminated by mining operations and radioactive wastes fall under the purview of these rules. Three, if the polluter is untraceable, the cost of remediation will be borne by a joint fund raised through public donations. Choose the correct options. One only, two and three only, one and three only, all of the above. Please provide your answers in the comment section and we will meet in the next video. For more informative content, like, share and subscribe and do not forget to press the bell icon to get the notifications.